Hi, I'm Arun Thomas, and I'll be talking about uh, Dtrace internals, digging into Dtrace. Um, so I'll be talking about how Dtrace works under the hood, particularly on FreeBSD, um, mostly because FreeBSD is the platform I'm most familiar with, but most of uh, the talk will apply to other operating systems that support Dtrace. Um, so I should note before we start uh, that I did not write Dtrace, uh, nor did I bring it to FreeBSD, um, but I've been doing a fair amount of uh, Dtrace hacking for a research project I've been working on. And so I've gained some knowledge about the internals of Dtrace, and so I'm hoping to share that with you all now. Um, so let's get started. Um, so I'll start off by talking about sort of the nature of uh, systems programming and our existence as uh, systems programmers. Um, so a systems programmer has seen the terrors of the world and understood the intrinsic horror of existence. Um, so as a systems programmer, this seems to kind of jive with me, and maybe it jives with you. Um, this is from a, a talk from a James Mickens, or sorry, a, an article from James Mickens. Uh, so he wrote it in a Usenix login. He's done a series of uh, pretty interesting and insightful um, pieces. And this one's called The Night Watch. And so I guess he's a, a Game of Thrones fan. So he likens uh, systems programmers to the Night Watch. So I guess we're the, the shield that protects the realms of men from kernel crashes and buggy application code. Um, so one of the reasons why systems programming is so painful is that we don't really have good tools. I mean, so it's hard. And then we don't really have good tools to figure out what's going on with the system. If we have to debug a problem or a kernel crash, um, there just aren't very many good tools. Um, and that's changing uh, with Dtrace. Um, so Mickens goes on to say, um, when you debug an OS kernel, you do it Texas style. You gather some mean, stoic people, people have seen things die, and you get some primitive tools, like a compass and a rucksack and a stick that's pointed on one end, and you walk into the wilderness and you look for trouble, possibly while using chewing tobacco. <laughs> so yeah, Mickens is pretty funny. But uh, in general, this is sort of the, one of the main problems with uh, kernel programming and systems programming is sort of the primitive tools. Um, so Dtrace helps there. Um, so I'd argue that Dtrace is an advanced debugging tool. Um, so I'd argue that it's like packing military-grade GPS and a lightsaber in your rucksack before heading into the wilderness Whoops, and looking for trouble. Uh, because kernel programming and systems programming is always going to be looking for trouble. I mean, that's just the nature of the game. But uh, it can be a little less painful. Um, so I'll go into, give a quick overview of my talk. So I'll start off with a quick refresher on Dtrace, a little Dtrace 101. And then we'll talk about the uh, sort of architecture of Dtrace at a high level some of the key components, some of the design decisions there. And then I'll look at a G Dtrace on FreeBSD, and we'll look at some code. Um, and it'll be pretty high level, because there's a lot of code there. Um, but I'll give you some of the key, uh, the key code samples and kind of go over that stuff. Um, so let's get started. So what is Dtrace? Uh, so Dtrace is safe dynamic tracing of production systems. Um, so the Solaris folks that created this, um, they were often debugging hard kernel problems on production systems. Um, and they wanted to, kernel debuggers are too slow. Um, they didn't want to have to add some, recompile the kernel to do printfs. They needed a better tool. Um, and they needed something that would be safe in production, so you don't crash like a production workload. And so this is the reason why they built Dtrace. And so Dtrace has this language, which is sort of the key interface to the system. Uh, and so it's called the D language, not to be confused with the other D language. Um, but the D language sort of drives instrumentation and reporting, and it's inspired by uh, the C language and awk, which sort of makes sense because the creators were Unix kernel hackers, so that's, uh, that's sort of seeped into the design of the D language. Uh, so Dtrace provides unified tracing of, full, of the full software stack, so you can trace applications, runtimes, libraries, the kernel, it's this unified framework. So it's pretty nice if you have to debug uh, a problem that involves both the user space and the kernel. You can actually get full visibility into the system. Uh, it's a single framework that supports a variety of instrumentation sources, so function boundary tracing, which allows you to do kernel um, function tracing, STT for statically defined trace points, syscall providers, PID providers, track user space events. I'll talk more about what these providers are um, in later slides. Um, one of the key design uh, goals of Dtrace was that there should be no overhead when a uh, Dtrace is not enabled. Um, so they basically didn't want you to pay any overhead when Dtrace wasn't being used, which is sort of critical to uh, have Dtrace go into Solaris. So when Dtrace actually is enabled, the overhead will depend on the provider that's being used and the probes that you enable and the action. So it'll be very dependent on the script that you're running on, or that you're running. 
Um, so DTrace is, originally comes from Solaris, but it's available on FreeBSD, NetBSD, macOS, and there's an open BSD port in progress, which is pretty cool. So what can DTrace trace? So it turns out a lot. Um, so you have function calls and user space and kernel, function arguments, return values, stack traces within user space and kernel, various programmer defined trace points. So you as a kernel hacker can add, or a user space hacker can add specific trace points for uh, points of interest in your program, which is kind of cool. Um, and then you can also trace data structures in the user space and the kernel and a lot more. Um, so here's a quick example. Um, so the, the slide's a little bit, uh, I'm using a fancy uh, HTML slide thing, so the formatting might be a little bit off because I sort of assumed uh, HDMI, but we'll, we'll make do. Um, so this is a, uh, an example of system call tracing um, using DTrace. So the way DTrace works is you basically define a probe, um, and so the probe here is syscall entry. So this will probe all of the system call entry points, and uh, there's an action associated with that probe, and the probe action is just a printf. So it'll print the, uh, the executable name and the, uh, the function that's being, uh, the probe function, which is actually the, uh, the system call name. So as you can see, there's a bunch of uh, system calls that are printed out. Um, so SS SSHD does a bunch of things, and NTPD does a bunch of things. So um, DTrace also has pretty advanced uh, reporting features. It has this thing called aggregations, so you can uh, do histograms. Uh, so this script gives you the sort of histogram of what happens of read sizes when you do uh, when for the read system call. So you get the whole histogram there, which is kind of cool for SSHD. Um, you can do kernel function tracing, um, so that works. And so kernel function tracing um, allows you, it uses the FBT provider, which st stands for function boundary tracing. And so you can trace any function, almost any function within the uh, kernel. And so in this particular example, um, you're seeing that uh, you're tracing the malloc function in the kernel and printing out what executable caused the malloc in the kernel and the size. Uh, you can also do user land tracing using the PID provider. Um, so this script allows you to um, basically do, uh, you can instrument all of the functions within libc that uh, ls is executing. And it also does a histogram using the aggregation thing. So there's a lot of things you can do, both in the kernel and user space. And then finally, uh, you, to give an example of statically defined tracing, uh, FreeBSD, or DTrace has a proc provider, which allows you to get uh, various inf a bunch of information about processes. Uh, so this shows you what happens when we are man-man. So um, it turns out, uh, so basically the, the event that we are uh, triggering on now is the um, successful execs. So this is what, these are all the things that are executed when you run man. So it turns out there's a lot of stuff that happens. There's an sh, syscuttle, locale run, zcat, head, man doc, zcat, and man doc again, and then less. So DTrace is kind of useful for when you want to kind of figure out what's going on in your system. So you can kind of explore what's happening under the hood. And a lot of times it's sort of surprising. Um, there's a lot of things that happen uh, in the system that you may not have expected unless you're very familiar with that system. Uh, so now I'll quickly go over some of the history of DTrace. So DTrace was created by uh, Brian Cantrill, Mike Shapiro, and Adam Leventhal at Sun Microsystems, often called the DTrace 3 or the DTrace Trio. Uh, so development began in 2001, and it was integrated into Solaris in 2003. Um, so this is the, the email that Brian Cantrill sent out uh, when DTrace was integrated. Um, so the subject was Houston Tranquility Base here, DTrace has landed. So 23 months after we set out, the first cut of DTrace has been integrated into Solaris 10. So it's pretty impressive that within two years, they were able to build the system and have it integrated into Solaris. And then in 2004, that's kind of when they announced DTrace to the world with their Usenix ATC paper. And then Solaris 10 was released in 2005. So it was four years from uh, the beginning of the project to it actually shipping in production code, which was pretty cool. Um, so in that, the same email, uh, Brian Kentrell also included some interesting merge stats. So um, in the Solaris kernel, um, uh, which is under user source UTS, UTS stands for the Unix time sharing system because that's what Unix used to be called. Uh, at that time, there were 1,757 files and uh, dtrace.c was the 12th longest file. Um, and if you've looked at dtrace.c, it's a, it's a really long file. Um, so that might not be surprising to you. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, 
In terms of the number of assertions, um, dtrace.c was the seventh highest in, num in the number of assertions. So they were very focused on building a kind of high quality engineering product. So this is one signal that they uh, were maybe somewhat successful. Um, and then in terms of the number of new lines of code they added, there was about 54,000 new lines that were added. Um, and then 17,000 lines were actually code. Um, of that, uh, and also they had added about 6,700 comments. So it was a fairly well commented piece of code. Um, so the next set of statistics I also thought was kind of interesting. So it took about 23 months for Dtrace to go into Solaris. Um, there were three engineers working on it. Um, originally, when they started the project, none of them were married or engaged. Um, by the end of it, uh, two of them were married and engaged. So it was kind of an interesting stat that they included because uh, life happens as you're sort of coding and building things. So uh, two years is kind of, can be a long period of time. Um, the other statistic that I thought was interesting was that uh, they had an internal mailing list for a D-Trace um, at Sun. And so there were 181 subscribers um, when, they, when this email went out. And only one person decided to unsubscribe. And so I'm wondering if uh, they just got sick of like systems programming, decided to do something else, became a gardener or something like that, uh, or just left Sun. But uh, yeah, it was interesting. It also wasn't clear if they were actually successful in, un in unsubscribing from the mailing list. But uh, I don't know. Um, so after the Solaris history, we get into sort of what happens with BSD and Mac OS. Um, so in 2007, sort of two years after the Solaris release, Mac OS got detraced and released 10.5. Um, it was merged into FreeBSD in 2008, and it was enabled by default in 2010. Um, it was also, uh, Dtrace was merged into NetBSD in 2010, and enabled by default in NetBSD. Um, so I guess that just means that the FreeBSD guys are cowboys who are happy to integrate Dtrace, or enable it by default much sooner than uh, NetBSD. Um, on, in 2016 is when uh, Dtrace on OpenBSD began, and so they're making good progress, I think. I think there was going to be a talk here about uh, um, Dtrace on OpenBSD, but I don't think it uh, worked out. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the D language. Uh, so D, not to be confused with the other D language, is a powerful, safe subset of C with elements of awk. Um, and so the safe subset is sort of the important part because you want to trace production systems. So a lot of the design of the language comes from that. So you can't do loops and um, there are a number of things that sort of come from that design decision. Um, so in addition to this sort of lineage, they also added a few new things on um, aggregations, which you saw earlier, predicates, so you can filter out uh, when probes fire, and associative arrays. Um, so just to give you some quick dtrace terminology, so dtrace has probes, and this is basically how you define what you want to trace, and it has actions. So when this probe fires, this is what will actually occur. So a printf statement, a trace statement, that kind of thing. So the probes have four parts. Uh, there's a provider, which is a dtrace defined module uh, that defines a kind of instrumentation. So this can be function boundary tracing if you want to trace the kernel. Um, there's a module, so this is a software module. So if you want to trace the kernel, a driver, a library, you, this is how you define it. Uh, there's a function, so this is a function in a module. So for instance, you might want to trace the write system call. And then there's the name, which is the specific probe that you want. Um, so you may want the entry point to the write system call. Um, so the actions go along with the probes, and so these are essentially D language statements that are carried out when a probe fires. So typically these things are reporting things like printfs and traces and aggregation statements and things like that. Uh, we also have predicates, which allow you to filter out uh, which probes will fire at runtime. So if you're only, specific, if you're only interested um, when a specific, a specific file is open, then you'll add a predicate to filter out um, other events. So here's a quick uh, syntax example. Um, so this is uh, a dtrace script that will, um, so the probe here, let's see if this works. Uh, so that's the probe, so you want, uh, the sys it's a syscall provider and you wanna trace the open system calls entry point. Um, and then there's a predicate here, so you're only interested in this specific file, the SSH host RSA key, um, and then you have an action, which is just a printf. And then there are a number of built-ins that Dtrace provides for convenience, like the timestamp, the PID, the UID, and the exec name. But this is kind of the general syntax of what uh, Dtrace looks like. You have probes, you'll have multiple probes, and you have multiple actions, essentially, with predicates. 
Uh, so dtrace has a lot of providers. Um, so there's FBT for function boundary tracing if you want to trace the kernel, syscall for tra tracing system calls, PID tracing for user space processes if you want to trace function, function entry return. You can also trace uh, specific instructions. Uh, there's PROC for tracing process operations, SCED for tracing scheduler operations, network protocols for IP, UDP, TCP, et cetera. Uh, there's a lock provider that allows you to trace kernel locking points, I.O. for I.O. calls, VFS for file system routines, profile for doing profiling uh, with a specific timing source. There's a, there's a provider for the MAC framework, uh, which allows you to trace the mandatory access control framework. And there's a new provider, uh, DT Audit, that allows you to trace the audit framework that's been recently merged into a FreeBSD by uh, Robert Watson. So there's a lot of stuff that you can, uh, there's a lot of information that you can get using DTrace. Um, so at a high level, there are a few main components of DTrace. So in user land, you have consumers, and so this is the command line client that you'll use. Um, so the canonical example is DTrace1, which is the command line client that we've been seeing. So when you run DTrace, that's a DTrace consumer. Um, it's basically just a user land executable that will talk to the kernel framework. So the consumers, DTrace1 and the other consumers, will use the libdtrace APIs. Um, and this, the libdtrace basically will talk to the kernel framework uh, using an ioctl, and we'll look more at how that works. So in the kernel, you have a generic instrumentation framework. That's kind of the core of the dtrace framework. Um, then you also have providers for specific instrumentation types, so FPT, PID, SDT, et cetera. And we'll talk more about how those work in a little bit. And then you also have various kernel hooks that are sprinkled with a, um, in the kernel, for instance, for trap handling so the dtrace can sort of take control. Um, additionally, you also have toolchain support. So there's D language compiler support. Um, so the D script eventually gets compiled down into an object format that um, is executed in the kernel. Um, there's also build support for CTF generation, which is a debugging format that I'll talk about later. So these are sort of the high level um, components. Um, so we'll talk a bit about the, uh, the DTrace core framework. Um, so it interfaces uh, to user space using the IOCTL, as I mentioned, uh, using device nodes under dev dtrace. The majority of the code is generic framework code. Um, it, does, it doesn't do any instrumentation. Um, it will delegate the instrumentation to providers, so there's a separation of concerns there. Um, so the dtrace core framework, a lot of what it does is it implements a virtual machine for the D-intermediate format. Um, and so this, is, this virtual machine is how uh, dtrace ensures the safety of the D-scripts. And so it's kind of analogous to Java bytecode, and we'll look at a bit more of how, how the diff looks. Um, so the D compiler is, has kind of the same steps as a C compiler. So a C compiler will spit out assembly code. The assembly code gets uh, assembled down into object code. And then all the object, calls, object code gets linked into an ELF executable. So the analogs in DTrace are that uh, D code, uh, the D script, gets compiled down to diff. So you can think of that as sort of the assembly for DTrace. Um, the diff code gets assembled down into diff O, uh, so diff O objects, so these are like the dot O's, for the predicates and actions that you see in the script. And then all the diff O's get merged together into a DOF, which is a D object format, which you can think of as sort of like the ELF, ELF for DTrace. Um, so it's essentially just kind of a compiler, um, just like the C compiler. Um, so diff has sort of a risk-like instruction set, um, but it's a little bit different in that it supports D language constructs. Um, so you have kind of loads and stores and things like that, but you also have things like you can access D variables using uh, the DT var, such as the ex executable name. Um, so here's an example from uh, the diff code, example of diff code. Um, and so if you want to run objump on diff code, you basically run dtrace s, and that'll spit out the diff code for you. And so you've got some load instructions that allow you to load the exec name, and then you can load it into register, and then you can return it back. So it looks kind of like a standard assembly language, except it's very focused on uh, supporting these D language constructs. And so the kernel dtrace framework, what it does is it'll take this diff code, and then it'll basically interpret it uh, to perform the actions that are defined in the D script. Uh, so the role of providers. Um, so providers are sort of how the instrumentation happens, and so they hold the, uh, the knowledge about specific instrumentation techniques. Um, so essentially what they do, one of the main things, in addition to defining probes, is enabling the probes when the consumer says so. And there are different ways of doing this. And the process is specific to each provider. So the main goal of each provider is to transfer control to the core DTrace framework, 
by calling the, uh, the dtrace probe function somehow. Um, and there are different ways to do this. Um, some providers do runtime patching in the executable, and we'll talk more about that when we look at FPT providers and the PID provider. Um, so once dtrace probe is running, then the core dtrace framework is running, and then I'll start doing the emulation of the diff code and running the actions and putting stuff in the buffer. Um, so here's kind of a, an overall architecture uh, for dtrace, and this diagram is shamelessly stolen from TeachBSD, and so I'd like to thank uh, Robert Watson and George Neville Neal for putting the diagram together and letting me use it. Um, so what you see here is there are two different scripts that are running. Um, so there's a green script and the yellow script at the bottom, top and bottom. And so they're tracing the same information, essentially. Uh, one's using function boundary tracing um, here, and then one's using uh, the DT malloc provider. And so the information that they're trying to get is uh, when the kernel malloc uh, function runs, uh, you want to find out what executable caused that and then what the size of the, uh, the malloc was. Um, and so you have, in dtrace land, you have this function boundary tracing provider and you have the DT malloc provider. And so function boundary tracing traces both the entry point to malloc and the uh, return for malloc. And the DT malloc provider basically embeds sort of a programmer annotation for the specific sta static trace point, and that's sort of like in the middle of malloc. But they both uh, produce the same uh, information. And so the way this sort of works is like once, uh, eventually the, what the providers do is they basically uh, set things up so that control gets transferred into dtrace probe, which is the entry point for the, uh, the dtrace framework. And I'll talk more about what that looks like uh, a little bit later. So once dtrace probe runs, you're in the dtrace core framework. Um, you'll do the diff interpretation to run the various predicates and actions in the dtrace, dtrace script. Um, and then these things like printf and trace will produce output that get put into these buffers. And so dtrace has a per script, per CPU buffers. So each script has its own set of buffers and they're per CPU. Um, so these buffers are kept in kernel space and then the dtrace processes, there's two of them for each of the scripts. Um, they'll eventually copy out those buffers using the dtrace ioctl. So this is sort of the, and then they'll print out the information to the uh, command line. And so this is sort of the general flow. You have the providers enabling instrumentation and enabling probes so that the core framework, dtrace probe, gets called. It'll do the diff interpretation to run the actions. It'll take the information, the trace statements that are out, put them into the buffer, and then the user land program will copy that stuff out and print it out. Um, so that's kind of the general flow of how dtrace works. Um, sort of a key data structure, I won't go into a lot of details, but one of the key data structures in dtrace is enabling control block. Uh, so it's a kernel data structure that represents an enabled probe. Um, so each ECB, it's a little bit small, but uh, for each probe that's enabled, um, so each ECB, there's a chain of ECBs, um, contains the diff O for the predicate and the action. So this is basically uh, the predicate from the Descript and the action. So there could be a printf or a trace or things for, for different consumers. Um, and so Typically, it, so you'll have a chain of ECBs if you have multiple consumers that are interested in a given probe. So if you have multiple scripts that are interested in syscall entry, syscall open entry, then you have multiple ECBs for each of those things. Um, so the way this works in action, so how this data structure gets used. Um, so when the probe is first enabled, the provider will rewrite the code to enter it in the dtrace framework in probe context. And uh, when the probe fires, the ECBs are iterated over. So and the diffo is, inter is interpreted in the kernel. Um, as the diffo is interpreted, as we saw in the architecture, data is placed in the buffers, consumers will periodically read the buffers. So that's kind of the, the overall flow. Um, when the consumer terminates, the ECBs are removed um, because the probes are no longer enabled. And if no ECBs are left for the probe, then we'll rewrite the code to re restore the original instruction. So basically restore things to how they were before the probe was enabled. Um, so there's a lot of details here. Um, more of it's, you can read more about in the, uh, the FreeBSD book. Uh, so now we'll look into a few of the kind of code samples that are there. Uh, we'll start looking into the code. Um, so this is from a Reddit AMA that Brian Cantrell did, one of the creators of Dtrace. Um, there was a person who was asking about, hey, I want to dig into the Dtrace code. Which, is there, are you planning to release a book? Are there good articles and things like that? And so Brian basically said that um, you should look at the code. I think he said, we'll see, his quote was, I would put 
the, uh, the dtrace source code up against anything for the thoroughness of its commenting. Once you understand the dtrace guide, go look at these files specifically. So dtrace.c, dtraceimpl.h. Um, there's one other file that I didn't mention, dtrace.h, that is also important. Um, he also mentioned a couple other high-level guides. Um, so the Usenix article, he also has an ACM article. And then Brendan Gregg has a couple of useful books as well. But the, the dtrace.c and dtraceimpl.h are pretty well commented, and they're kind of the core of uh, what dtrace does, the core framework. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about consumers. So, um, so these are the command line utilities that you'll use. So dtrace1 is the generic front end utility for, for dtrace. This is what you'll be running um, typically. It's sort of the canonical dtrace consumer. It's fairly long. It does a lot of stuff. Um, so uh, we won't talk about dtrace1 specifically. We'll look at a simpler example. Um, so there's also lockstat and plockstat, which are sort of uh, more customized consumers, and they're used for lock profiling and statistics and things like that. Uh, so writing a consumer, it's not that complicated. Um, so a dtrace consumer, as I mentioned, is a, it's a user-level program um, and that allows you to drive instrumentation. And so essentially, it will instruct the provider to create uh, or enable one or more probes, and it'll do the ingestion of uh, trace data from the buffers and print it out. Um, so using the lib dtrace APIs, you can write your own consumer, um, your own client, um, and you can do it in the language of your choice. Uh, people have written um, dtrace clients in Python. I've written one in Go. We're also using uh, one in Rust for a project I'm working on. Um, so as long as it links against lib dtrace, you can write in whatever language you want. And the lib dtrace API, it, there's only a few functions that you really need to kind of get a basic uh, consumer going. Uh, there's a lot more if you want to do more complicated things. Um, so if you want to sort of debug or see what's going on between the user space and kernel interface, um, there's a syscuttle that was added. So syscuttle debug.dtrace.verboseioctal equals one will show you exactly what are the oct ioctals that are going between the kernel and user space. Um, so here you can see that uh, there's an enable to enable some trace points. Go kicks off instrumentation, doff get status. And you can see here there's some copying out of the buffer and things like that. Um, so this is useful if you want to see what exactly is happening between the user space and kernel interface uh, for dtrace. Uh, so dtrace1, as I mentioned, is the canonical dtrace consumer. It's what most of you will be using. Um, if you want to look at the source code for the dtrace command, you can find it under cddl contrib open solaris command dtrace. Um, so the pads for dtrace are a little bit, um, it's occasionally hard to find the code because uh, CD, uh, the dtrace code is under cddl since it comes from solaris. Um, and so as a result, all that code is sort of put under the uh, cddl contrib directory. Um, but if you want to find the implementation, you can find it here. Uh, so we won't actually look at dtrace.c. We'll look at plockstat as it's a much simpler consumer. So at a high level, um, if you want to see what a consumer does, um, so the code's in plockstat.c. Um, so there are a few functions that you have to call. So dtrace open is sort of the initialization. You get a handle back. Um, then you'll call dtrace program stir compile. That'll basically compile your D script down to, to the diff code. Um, dtrace program exec is what you'll call to, um, to essentially enable the probe points. And then dtrace go kicks off the instrumentation. Uh, so once you've done that, um, there's basically a work loop that runs um, and calls dtrace work. Um, and dtrace work has this callback function called chew rec, which actually does the processing of the buffers. And so this is kind of the overall flow of what you'll need for a minimal consumer. Um, so there are more details, obviously, in the, in the file. And you can also look at dtrace1 if you want a more, exa uh, more a full-fledged example that uses more of the libdtrace API. But this will get you going if you want to write a quick uh, libdtrace consumer to do custom instrumentation. Uh, so if you want to dig more into the libdtrace source code, that's found under cddl contrib open solaris lib libdtrace. Uh, most of it's common code, but there's also some architecture-specific code. Um, the key header files there are dtrace.h and dtimple.h. And the key source files can be found under libdtrace common dt underscore star dot c. Uh, we'll look at one file in particular, dtopen.c. Um, the reason why this file is interesting is that it tells you which D language constructs are supported. Um, so here you can see the exec name that we've seen earlier, exit and sterlin. And so this will tell you sort of what language constructs are supported. And so dtrace has sort of evolved. The D language has evolved over time. So these were all included in a 
Dtrace version 1.0, but I think we're up to 1.12, and so people have been adding new language constructs over the years. So this is an interesting file to kind of see what, what's available in terms of language constructs. Um, if you're interested in the diff compilation process, how the Dscript goes down and gets translated to DOF code, uh, you can find that libdtrace. Uh, you'll start with the uh, compiler driver dtcc.c. And if you look at it, I mean, it looks like a compiler. You have a lex file, a yak file. There's a parser, there's a compiler driver, a diff code generator, a diff assembler, uh, something does DOF conversion. So if you're interested in this, you can look at the, uh, these files to see what's going on. Um, now we'll talk a little bit about the kernel framework and kind of the key source code there. Um, so you can find that under sys, cddl, contrib, open Solaris, uts, common, dtrace, and sys. And then the other file, there's a few files also under sys, cddl, dev, dtrace. Um, so this is kind of the, the key source code paths for the framework. Um, and if you're interested in the providers, you can find them under sysccdl dev. So there's the DT malloc provider, the FPT provider to do kernel function tracing, the profile provider, SDT for system statically defined tracing, and systrace for the syscall provider. So if you're interested in, the, interested in these, you can actually dig into the implementation by looking at these uh, specific directories. So the key source files uh, for the dtrace are dtrace.h, dtraceimpl.h, and dtrace.c, which uh, Brian Cantrell mentioned and is an AMA. So this is a comment from uh, dtrace.c. Um, so uh, this is, so it basically says, this is the implementation of the Solaris dynamic tracing framework, dtrace. The user visible interface to dtrace is described at length in the Solaris dynamic tracing guide. So that's a useful book if you want to uh, kind of get up to speed on the user space, how to use dtrace essentially. Um, this is, dtrace has a lot of options um, and it does a decent job of documenting them. Um, so it goes on, the comment goes on to say that the interfaces between the libdtrace library, the in-kernel dtrace, dtrace framework, and the dtrace providers are described in block comments in sysdtrace.h. And the internal architecture of dtrace is described in the block comments in sysdtrace and bool.h. And there's a lot of comments there to go through. Um, it's also interesting that he goes, the comment goes on to say that the comments contained within the dtrace implementation very much assume mastery of all of these source files, of all of these sources, if one has an unanswered question about the implementation, one should consult them first. As in, look at the code, don't ask us. Or, <laughs> um, so dtrace probe um, is, in the comments, it's described as the epicenter of dtrace. So this is when you get control, when the dtrace framework sort of takes control. Um, and so it's able to probe virtually any context. And so there's some restrictions there, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what, that, what those entail. Um, so, the dtrace probe essentially what will go into the dtrace framework and then it'll do the implementing of the actions and uh, by processing the enabling control blocks and the link diff code. So that's a big part of what it does. Um, so if you want to see what dtrace probe looks like, um, it's found in dtrace.c and as the comment says, if you're looking for the epicenter of dtrace, you just found it. This is a function called by the provider to fire probe from which all subsequent, subsequent probe context dtrace activity emanates. So you can go sort of trace through exactly what dtrace probe does um, if you look at this file. Um, so dtrace probe runs in probe context, which is a sort of a specialized context. And so interrupts are disabled for the CPU executing the probe. You can't, it doesn't do any memory allocation and it takes no locks. Um, so if you want more details on what probe context uh, details, you can look at this comment in dtrace.h. Um, so it says dtrace probe may be called in virtually any context, kernel user, interrupt, high level interrupt, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the only restrictions are that, that uh, it says the only latitude that must, that must be afforded to dtrace is the ability to make calls within itself and to its in-kernel subroutines and the ability to access arbitrary but mapped uh, memory. It also goes on to say that uh, dtrace probe may also not be called from any routine which may be called by dtrace probe, which includes functions in the dtrace framework and some in-kernel dtrace subroutines. Providers that instrument the kernel arbitrarily, such as FPT, should be sure not to instrument these routines. So basically, you shouldn't dtrace dtrace because bad things will happen. And in fact, uh, there's a comment in uh, the FPT provider which allows you to do kind of arbitrary function boundary tracing that says uh, employees of dtrace and their families are ineligible, void were prohibited. <laughs> there's a lot of kind of amusing comments in there. Um, so it's sort of interesting to read. Uh, so writing a provider, now that we've seen sort of the core framework and the consumers, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what, what the providers look like. Um, 
So providers are kernel modules that register a set of callbacks within the DTrace framework. Um, so there's the prototype provider, which provides a simple skeleton that shows you the key things that you need to add. But if you want a real provider, you should take a look at DT malloc. Um, so DT malloc has this array of uh, basically provider ops. And so the key ones that you have to define are DT malloc provide, which basically defines the specific probes, and DT malloc enable and disable, which is all you to enable and disable probes. Um, and then dtrace register is essentially how you register the uh, the DT malloc. Um, yeah. Maybe. No. Looks like a rechargeable pack. All right. Give me a minute. Sure. Do you want me to freestyle? I can, I can do that. Uh, Start right. Question of the break. Go. Ahead. So D trace cannot uh, trace itself. Right. So you can, you can sort of make it sometimes trace itself so if you turn off some checks, but yes. you shouldn't. <laughs> no. So, so I, I tried to trace malloc and free in the kernel, and I ended up with a feedback loop because I was storing the output from the script to a file. And then something in the process of storing the dtrace to disk involved malloc in the kernel. So it would be really nice to resolve that. Um, FreeBSD, it was FreeBSD I was using. Mm -hmm. So also you can figure out memory leaks uh, and so forth. Yeah, <laughs> that does sound useful. So, so, so what I did basically was just to uh, define malloc to a custom malloc function for the code I was debugging. So I, I made a new function that called oh, that's a good way. and I traced that instead. Uh -huh. and, and then also, yeah, that's a good way to do it. I think that you can probably exclude the code you don't care about with predicates. So like, if you're only interested in that's a good idea. process, you could say, you know, I, only want to, I only want to trace malloc with from this process or from this library. Rather than having to you know, change the call points. And that way you could exclude like, the D trace process or whatever it was that was causing the feedback. Well, I didn't think about that. I'm not an expert yet, but it sounds like a good idea to exclude like, tracing script for itself. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
they're executed in the order you declare it there. Okay. So if you like, when I hit this probe, do this, then if you say, oh, also when I hit this probe, do this other thing, they execute in that order. Okay. Well, actually, that's not written down anywhere. I know, but it's <laughs> very true. Yeah, it is very true. It's all the time. I'm writing things down right now, so I'll go right down there. Nice. All right, so. All right, so I'll continue. So yeah, DT malloc is a good uh, example to look at. And so the dtrace register uh, function is how you basically register the uh, provider ops. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit quickly about some of how, a bit about how each of these providers work or how they do instrumentation. Um, so FBT, function boundary tracing, is how kernel function tracing happens. Uh, the PID provider is how user, user space function tracing happens. And then SDT is statically defined tracing. It's basically how you have, uh, you add annotations, you add static trace points to the kernel. Um, so it works a little bit differently than FBT and PID. Um, user space statically defined tracing exists, but we won't discuss it because it's a little bit complicated and we, we won't have time to uh, discuss it. Um, so FBT and PID use similar runtime patching techniques. Um, and the reason why they do uh, runtime patching is to, um, Dtrace wants to make sure, one of the key goals of Dtrace is that you shouldn't have to pay any overhead uh, when you're not using it. And so the, by using runtime patching, there's no disabled probe overhead. So this is sort of an important design goal of Dtrace. Um, so before I go into FBT and CTF, uh, so I'll, uh, before I go into FBT, I'll talk a little bit about CTF. So CTF is the compact C type format. Um, it comes from uh, Solaris. Uh, it's like dwarf, but it's simpler. It's easier to parse and generally more compact, as the name might imply. Um, and this is how Dtrace gets debugging information, so function arguments, things like that. And it's used to create function entry and return probes uh, for FBT. Uh, so if you built the FreeBSD kernel, um, uh, you might have noticed that CTF is generated during the build process. You might have seen CTF convert and CTF merge running. Um, and so what these commands do, so CTF convert will convert the dwarf information to CTF, and then it basically creates this sun w CTF succession on W CTF section, and then CTF merge will merge all of the, the multiple CTF sections into one. So if you run a uh, read elf, if you run a uh, read elf on the kernel, um, you can see this uh, sun W CTF section. That's where all the CTF uh, stuff goes. Um, so the way FBT does probe insertion, um, if you want to enable a probe, um, basically it just patches in a breakpoint instruction. Um, so there are two kind of, this is sort of, up here is pre-dtrace, so we have the sysgetpid um, system call. Um, and if you want to, or function, I guess, and if you want to uh, replace, if you want to basically enable uh, the dtrace uh, instrumentation on sysgetpid entry, um, you'll see that uh, the push instruction, the first instruction, is replaced by n3, so dtrace can get control at the entry point. Um, and then so once dtrace, in, once the breakpoint happens, the kernel takes control and eventually uh, dtrace probe gets called. Um, so once you're in the dtrace framework, um, the first instruction, which here is a push, is emulated by uh, the dtrace framework. And then it'll do the instrumentation thing. Um, and then the, um, the push instruction is restored once the, uh, the probe is sort of disabled um, and when dtrace one exits. So basically, you want to clean up the instrumentation that you've added. Um, but if you run KGDB, you can actually see this happening live. Um, so if you look at the different architectures, so uh, for x86, it's uh, basically just does an int3, which is cc. You can look at fbt isa.c to see exactly what value is being patched. Um, an ARMv8, which is well, the 64-bit version of ARMv8, um, it uses this instruction, arc 64 break. And then for risk five, it uses a S break. Um, so I'll quickly go over what happens when you do trap handling on ARMv8. It's a similar process on risk five and uh, x86-64. Um, basically, you'll get into the exception handler after the, uh, the breakpoint instruction happens. And eventually, through some code path, you get to dtrace probe. And then the core framework takes over. So if you actually want to trace it through, you, it goes from do EL1H sync. So EL1 is the privilege level for the kernel goes to dtrace invop, fbt invop, and then to dtrace probe. Um, I'm not going to go into the details, but if you actually do want to trace through it, you can using uh, this uh, map. Um, 
Um, so once dtrace probe runs, then the core kernel framework uh, is running, and then it'll do the diff interpretation and kind of uh, uh, doing all the buffering and all of that stuff to take the trace output. Uh, so the PID provider, um, which does user space interpretation uh, functions and returns, does a pretty similar thing. It also does runtime patching. So in x86, it also does the breakpoint thing. Um, basically just overwrites the entry point with a breakpoint. Um, so it's in 3 on x86-64. And I, as far as I know, there still isn't ARMv8 or RISC-V support yet, but I'm sure that'll change. Uh, if you want to see what the value is, you can look at fasttrapisa.c. And if you want to actually see how the patching happens, you can look at the fast trap trace point install function. And so since uh, we're actually patching, so this uwrite function is what patches the, uh, the program counter in user space uh, to the, with a breakpoint. And so it'll do the same thing as the FPT probe. So once you get in the breakpoint, it eventually gets into dtrace probe and the core kernel uh, dtrace framework takes over. Um, so SDTs are a little bit different. Um, so we saw this example earlier of uh, tracing successful exec calls using the proc provider. Um, so this is how you define a uh, static trace point, which um, is generally a useful thing to know if you want to um, add new trace points to the system, um, which tend to be fairly useful. Um, so the first thing you'll do is uh, declare a provider. So in this case, we declare the proc provider. Um, you need to declare the kind of interface for the STD, uh, for the probe. And so you'll do that using the STD probe define one, or I think there's one through six uh, functions. And the actual probe is placed in the code. So this is the actual probe point. This is just the definition. So STD probe one allows you to actually have the exec success probe. Um, and there's more documentation in the headers on how to do this. But this is essentially how you would define a uh, trace point. Um, so the way the transfer, the way control is transferred to the dtrace framework is a little bit different. So on Solaris and Mac OS, SDTs, um, so these SDT probe one, this uh, the static trace point actually uh, is, it basically turns into a NOP. Um, and so at runtime, these NOPs are rewritten to eventually enter into the dtrace probe and the, the core framework. Um, so then, um, and then eventually it'll trap into the kernel uh, when they're enabled. Um, so on FreeBSD, it's a little bit different. So the SDT probes are actually function pointers that are embedded into the code. Um, so you can see this here in SDT load. There's this function pointer, SDT probe func, that will, when you want to load the, uh, when you want to enable the probe, um, it'll uh, set dtrace probe. And this is basically just the definition of how this stuff gets set up. So Mark Johnson actually has some patches to do the similar, to do the not patching thing on, uh, on FreeBSD, but it wasn't clear that the performance is actually better, but, uh, right? Uh, it's, it's pretty marginal. It's marginal. There's, there's issues with the implementation. Okay. We can't really do what Solaris does because we don't have a relocatable kernel, so we have to resource something uh, perhaps. Okay. It's not really clear that that's. Yeah. So, yeah. patches exist, but maybe not worthwhile doing. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of like the providers. There's a bunch of other dtrace code you can look into, there's translators. Uh, there's a bunch of scripts if you want examples of dtrace scripts. And there is a test suite. And uh, George and various people have been doing, George Neville Neal and various people have been doing a number of uh, improvements to the test suite. Um, Apple folks have also been making additions to the, uh, the test suite. So if you want to help, we could use more help with the test suite. Um, so there are a lot of resources for dtrace. Um, so Brendan Gregg's books are really good if you want to use dtrace. And they have a little bit about the implementation. Uh, the DNI book uh, that describes the FreeBSD operating system has a good section about how the ECBs and all that stuff works um, within dtrace. Uh, the dynamic tracing guide is also a good guide to kind of get started. The FreeBSD handbook also has useful information. If you want a high level kind of architectural overview, uh, the Usenix paper and the ACMQ paper are both pretty good to read. Um, the dtrace for BSD, so when uh, I think it was John Burrell did the dtrace for FreeBSD work, um, he originally presented a BSD CAN 2008, so almost 10 years ago. Um, so that was actually a pretty useful talk as I was kind of preparing uh, this presentation. Um, there's another article on the dtrace backend, or I think it was a presentation, uh, the dtrace backend on Solaris for x86 and x64. That has a lot of interesting details on how things work on x86. And then I've found all the dtrace developer blogs to be really useful. So Brian Cantrill and Adam Leventhal and all these guys, and Brendan Gregg in particular, have had really great uh, 
blogs on various how various things work. And so that was really useful in putting this presentation together. So old uh, posts on the blog, old blog posts have been very useful. Um, awesome Dtrace is also another good resource. It has a whole bunch of links for Dtrace things. Um, so there's a lot of information there to kind of get you up to speed as you're digging into the code. Um, so cool, thanks. So I'd like to thank a number of people for providing input to this uh, talk. So George Neville Neal, Robert Watson, Mark Johnston, Russell Buchan, Andrew Turner, Andrew Turner, Samuel Lepetit, and everyone who's hacked Dtrace on any platform because uh, Dtrace is a pretty cool uh, tool. Um, so in summary, uh, Dtrace is a powerful tool. Um, it makes our existence less horrifying and more useful. Um, and so we've kind of looked at how Dtrace works at sort of a high level. We did the kind of refresher of Dtrace. We looked at the high level architecture and looked at some of the FreeBSD code. Um, and so it's pretty similar on other architectures. Um, but we sort of scratched the surface. So there's a lot more code to dig through. Um, and so in the presentation, each of the code snippets is a uh, accompanied with a link to GitHub. So if you want to dig, more, dig a bit more into what's going on, you can do that. So I'll leave that sort of an exercise for the reader. Um, so I should note that uh, after lunch, um, so this sort of describes Dtrace as it sort of exists and sort of the current implementation. Um, so Brian Kidney is going to give a talk uh, after lunch about some of the things we've been doing with Dtrace to kind of, uh, we've been making some changes there and sort of our sort of where we see the future directions of Dtrace on FreeBSD. So you should definitely check that out. And so, uh, yeah, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Go. Cool. Oh. oh, hey. Yeah, George fixed that, sort of. <laughs> so I've, so depending on the machine that you have, there's, there's sort of limits that you can set. And so we've kind of bumped the limits up in newer FreeBSD. And I think George also added a syscuttle. So I, for some of the instruments, some of the work that we've been doing, I've set the buffer sizes pretty high, like 128 megs. Um, so, but I think George has upped the limit to something, and then there is a syscuttle now to... I think it is, yeah. Yeah, so I have not, I have not crashed a process by attaching the <laughs> to it basically quite now, which is a common problem. It's good, yeah. Um, I believe there was an issue with building. Uh, so yeah, the, the integration with the build system is, is pretty finicky uh, because you actually have to add this extra linking step. Um, and it, it, yeah, it tends to be really difficult to integrate into existing build processes. Yeah. Um, Fixing that would require some sort of linker support, uh, <coughs> like just making making aware of, of probe sites. 
Um, so that's something we don't really have. Um, as far as stability, I mean, like we use it at my company, we have like a Python USDT provider, um, and I, I haven't seen any bugs coming in lately. It, 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 certainly there's there's still some uh, corner cases, but- And what's, what's the reference point, so what? This would be on the 11th. Like stable, stable <laughs> release? Yeah, so everything from 11.0 forward, okay. um, we should be fine. Mark, did plans to upstream the uh, US, the Python USDT thing? Uh, no, because I think other people have, and it's the Python devs that have not been super amenable to it. Okay. Um, I, I don't really know the reasons. Okay. There's not just floating around if, if you say Google for them. Mm -hmm. Because we build all of our packages from scratch internally, that's not a problem for us. We just have to support the device. So the, the build system problem, the, the main thing is that the D3 set is the total files. So we are losing a binary, like the normal files change, but now we don't really want to run the thing again. So the mate doesn't get very happy. <coughs> the, we have to change the presentation. You have the, uh, right now when you do a probe, that has a relocation to match main and decrease and goes in and adds that relocation to be nothing. So, but it needs the opposite. It's like you need a metadata section that reference put the probe over there. And that way you don't even need to make any special linker magic. Like right? you just run the linker, it's gonna concatenate the sections not knowing what they are. Hmm. Everything works. I found that I'm like, working on LOD and decrease was kinda of painful. Oh, <laughs> 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 I just like the kind of decrease. CTF convert. Uh, is there any recommendation using compiler optimizations or not when you CTF convert object files? Because, for example, I've seen things like return statements being optimized into go tos, and currently CTF convert doesn't understand that and it doesn't generate an uh, exit point for the probe. Yeah, I think we lose some information using CTF. I don't know if this is the no, specific problem. The the yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's, the compiler optimization thing is one thing, but if we had dwarf, we'd have better information. So we could actually instrument like static functions and things like that. Um, so I want John Anderson to do his thing. So well, I'll make this better. <laughs> yeah. This is. Yeah, this is this is more of an optimization issue. Yeah. Yeah. Instructions before the bell tops that you guys could then detect and know, okay, I know that we're about to do this, this function now, right? Because I see this instruction sequence and I can catch that. But the thing is that that's not sufficient because uh, when, when, you, when you jump to the callee, you're not returning from that function, right? You have to, you have to wait until the callee returns. <laughs> and yeah, you're yeah. actually totally. You would use the front view, see like out of order. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, you can actually detect tail tops by just looking. Like a jumper, like a hop frame pointer, called a jump assume you can have frame pointers. Again, you can, if you overwrite the return address, so that when you return from the callee, you jump this kind of enabled probe state, you can actually do this trick. But that breaks other things like staff and winding. So I think it's complicated. Technically, it's lunch time. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Cool. All right. Thanks. <laughs>